So now we'll take a look at another type of a scenario involving switches. And these could be manual switches. These could be motorized switches we can control via SCADA. Uh, a re recloser could actually be used as a switch, right? Um, John Guy to partner that out. And so what this scenario involves is if we have a faulted section, what we're gonna do is we're gonna isolate that section so I can restore service to the rest of the circuit. So these are normally closed switches that I could open up as needed. And uh, we're gonna talk about first what we call an upstream switching, upstream isolation. And then uh, the example after this, we'll get into what happens when we have a, a downstream switch that we could operate as well that gives us even more flexibility. And so the way this would work is if there was a fault, what I would do is I would look for the nearest upstream switch. I could open that up if it turns out that I can um, get that switch pretty quickly, at least um, that time is less than the time it would take me to repair the section. And then basically if I had a, an upstream operation of protection device, I would actually close that and I could restore service to the, the rest of the system. So the way this would actually look is, is kind of shown here. And this is a new circuit configuration. So we're moving away from the, the previous setup or we're set up a, a new base case as a result. But what I've got is I've got a circuit, it's three line segments still, but now what I've done is I've put a sectionalizing switch at this particular point. And this is going to be normally closed. And we're going to assume it's manually operated for now. It's going to take one hour for a crew to get out there once they've been instructed to and, and actually operate that switch. So I have to have a new data set for this. Um, basically, I'm just going to look at permanent faults. I'm going to assume I'm going to have one fault per year per kilometer. That's going to take four hours of repair. I'm going to use those same statistics for each of the different line sections. You note that I don't have any temporary faults shown in this case, and that's because for temporary faults, for the most part, those are all going to be cleared. Those are typically not going to result in that many SADI events. And so what we're kind of focused on with the switching operations, we're, we're usually just kind of focused more on the permanent faults because in, in the cases where we have manual switches, those are all gonna involve sustained outages anyway. The other thing is as far as the switching times, this is kind of a large number. And so if we wanna get this number down, then we're gonna need to have some automated switching, which we'll get in toward the end of this particular example. So what we first need to do is we need to have a base case. And so for the base case, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through and just assume that even though the switch is here, it's not used. And then based on the, the failure rate, I'm gonna have one fault event per line section per year. And since the mean time to repair is four hours, then basically there's gonna be four hours of outage associated with those three different events. So when we sum up everything, basically what we're gonna see is we're gonna have three outages, three times four is gonna give us 12 outage hours for both of these customers. So the fact that line section number two has a fault, if we don't consider switching means that customers on line section three suffer. So we can compute our indices. The indices are pretty basic in this case. Note in this case, I have the same number of customers at both load points. But if I multiply the number of badges by the number of customers for A and B, add those together and, and normalize by the total customer count, I get three interruptions per year. Do a similar operation for Sadie, I'm gonna get 12 hours per year. So not a very good number. I can put all this information into the contingency table as well. Um, basically, we get the same results. Uh, not so interesting in this case because you don't have any momentary events. And basically, both customers see exactly the same events the same way anyway. Um, and so this isn't really as interesting as it was uh, before, but we can still use this contingency table. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to add the upstream isolation. 
And so what I'm going to have now is I'm going to have this switch in here. As far as the count of the number of failures, I still get the same number of failures. I'm still going to get one fault per year on line one. I'm going to get one fault per year on line three. I'm going to get one fault per year on line number two. So I've still got the same number of sustained failures in this case. But now what's different is let's suppose I have a fault on line section number two. It still takes me four hours of repair, but what I can do is I can send a crew out to the field and I can open this switch. I can open this sectionalizing switch. And as soon as this sectionalizing switch gets open, then I can close this circuit breaker even though the customers on line section two are out, I can still restore service to load A, right? And so what this means, I, I still have the sustained outage, but now customers at load A only see one outage hour, whereas customers at load B are gonna see the four hours, all right? So if I can put switches up out there, I can kind of reconfigure the circuit. I can, I can isolate that fault. And that means I can go ahead and restore service to the rest of the customers. Now, if I have a fault on line one, everybody's out of luck. But if I have a fault on line section two, I, can, I could use isolation there. If I had a fault on three and put another switch in there, I could isolate that as well. And, and keep in mind too, the fuse could serve as a, an isolation switch in a way. I mean, you could actually go out there and manually operate a switch as well. But um, basically customer A is gonna get restored in the time it takes to isolate line section number two, all right? So this is really the change. This is really the change from the base case. For these other two faults, these are gonna result in, in two outages per customer. If it takes four hours to repair each one, that's gonna be a total of eight outage hours. And then what we can do is we can add up everything all together. And now what you're going to see is you're going to see the difference. Still have the same number of sustained outages, but the net outage hours for B is 12, whereas for A is only nine. So it's dropped from 12 down to nine. So now when we look at the safety number, safety number hasn't changed any. But what changes is the SATI. And so for A, you factor in the nine hours. For B, you got the 12 hours. And now what you've seen is this has been dropped down to 10.5 from 12. So you could put all this into the contingency table if you want. Um, basically, where this shows, where this difference shows up is in line section number two which is results in only one outage hour for A versus four outage hours for B. This cuts down the total number of outage hours. And when you factor away in the number of customers, you see this change right here on the, on the SADI number. This doesn't really seem like that much of an impact. You know, we've gone from 12 to 10.5 hours per year uh, if we've got manual switching, we still haven't improved the, um, the frequency index any, but we have made a change on the SADI side. And this impact obviously is going to depend on where the customers are actually located at. And, and even though it doesn't seem like much of an improvement, these manual switches are relatively inexpensive. You know, if I, this just can be manual operated, it doesn't really cost that much to put a switch set out in the field. And so I could actually afford to have a lot of these different locations put out there, say like compared to the cost of putting a recloser. And it's really a very economical way for me to improve reliability. And so by having a lot of these locations out in the field at strategic positions, uh, I can make it a lot easier to reconfigure the circuit, which is gonna Im improve my SADI counts. Now, Let's suppose we had automation. Let's suppose I had a motorized switch that the SCADA operator, um, somebody operating in control center could actually control remotely. Then basically what this does is it dramatically reduces this mean time to switch, all right? And so if that's the case, then I could open this switch in much less time and I can cut that outage time 
for those customers at location A even further. And if this is a motorized switch, I mean, it's conceivably this, this can drop down even one minute. Now, this is assuming that I've got some type of fault location where I know for sure that that faulted section is below that switch. And so I, I might have some type of a fault current indicator on that switch to help me out. And so if this is the case, if this outage for customer A is small enough, this might just be a momentary outage. It just might play into a MAFI number instead of coming, you know, being factored into a safety number. It depends on the utility. So for the automated upstream isolation case, um, we still have, again, the same number of events. We're still going to have one fault on each section, but now I've got a switch that operates in one minute or one sixtieth of an hour. And then when I look at this case and what's going to happen if I have a fault on line section two, customers at B are out of luck. They're going to see one sustained outage. It's going to take four hours to fix. However, if for customers at load A, then once I operate that switch, well, they're back in business. They don't actually even see a sustained outage anymore. That would count as a MAFI. And then as far as an outage hour, that's going to be 1 60th of an hour. Whether this um, is factored into the SADI or not kind of pins the utility. I mean, the utility could theoretically not include this or they can actually include it. The, the problem you get into is if the cutoff period is like five minutes, it, it'd be kind of hard to have in the logic you know, something where you actually track exactly when that switching operation would occur, whether it actually happened in one minute or happened in five minutes. But I mean, suppose we even get that down to, to one minute, you, you may not even have to count any outage hour time. So I just went ahead and included it so you could see it. But depending on the utility, may, they may not even have to factor this in. So we still have the same outage count due to events on line section one and three. Um, basically, for these customers at B, they have no other path to be fed. Um, the, the same with A, if you mess up here, um, you know, you have no other way of feeding in, in A and B. And so um, you're still going to have the same impact of those um, permanent faults on line section one to three, unless you, you know you put some other switches in the circuit, which we'll get into this a little bit. And then when you add up everything all together, you're gonna to see you've got three outages at B, 12 outage hours. You're gonna have two sustained outages at A, eight outage, a little over eight hours, outage hours, 8.017. And so, um, you know, we can put these into the safety and the safety indices in this particular case. If we reduce the outage count at load A by one, this is going to change out of job, I'm sorry, safety to 2.5. And then the SADI, we're, we're, we're dropping that from 12 to 8.017, which, which gives us a SADI number of about 10 hours per year. So this is the contingency table. If you decide to fill out the contingency table, basically what you're changing in here is you're changing this impact of line to permanent fault on customer A, and this is the result in the, in the indices. So again, as far as the, the comments on the automation of the isolation, if you compare this to having the, um, the manually controlled switch versus the automated switch, You'll notice in this case that this, the net SADI doesn't really drop that much. It goes from 10.5 down to 10. Um, the impact's going to basically depend on you know the failure rates. And so if that, that particular line section um, had a lot more events on it, this would make this a lot more attractive. What would also make this more attractive if there is a lot more customers at load A than there was say like at B, right? Or there could be like a could be like a hospital load A, right? So that would make it more worthwhile to have that automated switch there. 
so you can restore those customers a day as, as, as fast as possible. And we'll talk about automation more in a, in a future lecture as far as the things you'd want to consider in that case. Um, but what you're going to kind of see is you're, you kind of see like a diminishing return and that when we actually automate that switch, we don't necessarily get this, this huge change in reliability um, depending on the circumstance. In this particular case, we really didn't get that much of a change. For, so for adding kind of an expensive switch, you know, maybe the bang for the buck wasn't, wasn't worth it, but in other situations it could be. We'll talk more about that in a future lecture. So another case is backfeeding. And so what we're looking at in this case, if I have the upstream isolation, that's great you know, if the fault's below, but what would happen if the fault were above? And so if you go back to this particular scenario, if you have a fault here, if you had the switch, is there some way of feeding load B? And that would be the case if I could put a back feed in here where I can actually feed those customers from B through what we call a, an open tie switch. And so that's what we're going to talk about next is that particular case. And so this kind of outlines the procedure, which you can actually read through. It's a little bit verbose, but I think it's just easier just to kind of go through an example of what this involves. So what I've got is I've got load at locations A, B, and C. D's on a second circuit, right? So I've got a normally open tie switch here. This is sometimes called a tie switch. And I've got two normally closed sectionalizing switches. So let's suppose I have a fault at A, what's gonna happen? Well, what's gonna happen is this breaker is gonna trip open and everybody's gonna be in the dark on this circuit. A, B, and C is gonna be in the dark. What I could do is I could send a crew out into the field. I could then open this isolation switch and that way, you know, they can start working on the fall today. And then what I could do is I can close this tie switch. And so in order to have customers downstream of a fault be reconnected, you need to have a switch pair. All right. You need to have a switch pair. And you need to have what we refer to as a back feed. You know, like I'm back feeding these customers on B and C from another circuit. If I have the fault and it's at B, again, this switch right here is gonna lock open. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open this switch. I'm gonna open this switch. So again, I'm operating a switch pair. I'm basically isolating this section. Then I could close the circuit breaker and then I could also then close the tie switch. And so that'll restore A and C even though B has to wait for the meantime to repair. And then finally, if I have the fault here at C, what I could do is if this upstream breaker had operated open, what I can do is I can open up this switch right here. This switch is already open. I don't really need a pair in this case because I've already got the normally open switch on one side. But then what I could do is I could then close this back in again after it locked open. And then A and B would have service uh, and C would have to wait, right? And so if the time to do the switching is less than the time to repair, it's worthwhile for a crew out there and do the circuit reconfiguration first before they actually would fix the fault. So this is a, the scenario we're gonna look at. And since this is a new scenario, we've got to redo the base case. This is pretty simplistic. Um, usually it'd be more complicated than this, but basically what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be looking for a way where if I have a fault on line one, I'm going to be opening up this switch and closing up this switch. And this is what we refer to as a back feed scenario. I'm going to, even though I have a second source also, I'm just going to do the reliability on source number one. Having the tie switch actually benefits both circuits, but I'm just going to do the calculations on source one. So here's the reliability data. 
I've got line lengths in here. I've got mean time to repairs. I've got times to switches. I've got to make some assumptions about the operation of switch pairs, whether this is additive or you know what the timing's going to be. I, I also got information about load. So each customer's got 2,500 kVA of load. And note what I'm doing is I'm putting ratings on all my components. I'm putting ratings on my source. I'm putting ratings on my lines and ratings on my switches. And the reason I'm doing this is one thing you have to make sure of when you're doing the back feed is you need to make sure that if I've got so much load at A, that the circuit I'm transferring that load to can take that load. It, I'm not going to be overloading source two circuit, right? So you have to do a capacity check and also like check voltages and things like that, but mostly capacity. So for this particular circuit, again, I have to kind of do a base case if I want to see what the benefit of putting the, the back feed is. What I'm going to assume is I got this switch, it's always closed. Um, I can operate that like in one hour if I need to. Um, I've got an open tie switch right here and it's gonna be open, but we're not gonna consider using it. And then what we're gonna have is because of the failure rates, we're gonna have two faults per year on line one and we're gonna have one fault per year on line number two. So you look at the some of the permanent fault contributions in this case to kind of figure out what's going on. And the, the issue that load A has in this case is since it has no back feed and it's directly connected up to line two, that any time you have a permanent fault, this is going to result in a sustained outage at A. You know, we're going to have three sustained outages, four hours to fix each one, it gives us a total of 12. Uh, you could put this into a table. You see, it's a pretty simplistic table because I've only got two fault locations in this case, and you can see the totals right here. <clears throat> now, now we have the back feeding, and what's going to change now is what happens when we have a fault here. So again, I've still got the same number of faults, but but now I've got this option here for operating this tie switch, and. If I have a fault now on line section number one, then what I can do is I can send a crew out here, isolate load A from line number one, and then maybe that same crew would go over here and operate this switch closed. Now, I'm going to assume in this case that, that took me two hours. That's kind of a long time. Usually for a switch pair, it would be a lower number, and I would probably give that to you in a problem statement. But in this case, we'll just assume that it's one hour here, one hour here. The time it takes to perform this operation is two hours. And so instead of having to wait four hours for the line to be repaired, I can get these customers back in two hours. And so it's if they're still going to see two sustained outages because they have to wait for the switching to occur. But now the net outage time goes from um, drops down to, to four outage hours. So again, this is kind of long because of the way I set the problem up and I, I might would give you maybe like a switch pair time instead. So again, you need to do a capacity check. This load is 2500 kVA. So what you need to make sure of is if this substation has a certain capacity, that you don't overload the substation. And if this line has a certain capacity, you don't overload it. And so this is something you always need to be, to be looking at. Um, utilities would actually have a computer program they would run for this. Uh, this sometimes this is a switch order management program. It would have a name with switches in it. But basically what they would do is they would figure out when customers are out, what are the options for reconfiguring the circuit whether we're going to have any overloads or not, whether we're going to have any voltage problems. And basically what they would come up with is a list, say, well, you need to operate this switch open and operate this switch and operate this switch, this switch, this switch. And if the crew follows a switching sequence and they can optimally restore all the customers back to service. So it's a little bit more what we need to worry about now, but just keep in mind that when you're doing reconfiguration, 
you need to make sure you can um, put load on adjacent circuit. This is why for backfeeding purposes, we typically don't load a substation and the circuit breaker up to its max because we want to leave some headroom for doing reconfiguration. So anyway, here's uh, the total count we run into in this particular case, three outages, uh, but we got this from 12 down to eight hours now. So we get some improvements from that standpoint. And um, then what we're gonna look at is one more example where we're kind of combining some of these other concepts together then. So let's go ahead and we'll end this video here and we'll do this last example in the third segment then.